just maybe shortly to introduce why I'm here. I am personally a postdoc who during Corona and my PhD gets super excited in anything creative, mixing art and science. And that's why I'm happy to introduce Jen to you a little bit. Uh, I'm uh, quite glad to see that even despite a little bit of delay, there's quite many of you joining in for this EGU webinar on effective and likely also pretty creative visualization science. This webinar will last about one hour. Maybe now with a little bit of delay, um, you can have an extended lunch webinar, so to say. Um, but later this webinar will be um, available on YouTube as well. So you, if you miss any part, if you don't have full time, you can check it out or keep an eye on it for next week. Uh, many of us will know that a figure can actually make or break any visual presentation. So maybe a paper, a talk or a poster. Yet very few of us actually ever really learned which principles define a really good visual. And that actually really enhances the message of our science that we want to tell. And I personally know no better speaker on this matter than Jen Christiansen, who will take you on the journey of effective and accessible graphics today. Jen now works as a science communicator of the visual variety, as she says. And she draws plenty of experience actually from an education, both a scientist and an artist, but especially also from being the senior graphics editor at senior, uh, Scientific American. She also recently wrote this <laughs> amazing book called Building Science Graphics. And um, this is actually really great for, especially when you're a scientist and you become more and more interested in the graphic side of things. Um, but with this teaser, I will give the space to Jen first and later open it up for you, as um, Simon already said, for questions. So please put them in the Q&A and we will come back at you after Jen's talk. So with that, I would say, Jen, floor is yours. Thanks so much, Maria. And thanks to everyone for sticking around. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see, I'm going to start my slideshow here. So again, um, thanks for inviting me to join you today to talk about uh, science graphics. Um, I'm going to start with some context so you can better understand my point of view. And then I'm going to jump to some definitions and background information. Um, I'll touch upon how graphics fit into the practice of science communication. And then I'm going to pass along some top tips for designing science graphics. And finally, I'm going to share just a few makeover examples. Um, so that should all take about a half hour, and then um, we can have a Q&A. So for more on design basics and a deeper dive on what I'll be sharing today, um, you can check out my book, Building Science Graphics. Um, on this web page, I have a clickable list of additional resources, um, so many of which are available freely online. Okay, so for some context, um, a little bit about me so you can better understand what's informed my point of view. I double majored in geology and studio art at Smith College, where I completed an honors thesis on trace, the trace fossil um, gyrolithes under the mentorship of Al Curran. Then I completed a one-year science communication graduate program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, instead of dedicating myself to a single line of scientific research in the geosciences, um, I opted for a path that would allow me to make other people's research accessible to wider audiences using a visual language. So that program set me on a path to Scientific American, where I've spent the majority of my career in two intervals, um, the first in the mid to late 90s, um, and then again from 2007 until today. Um, between those two intervals, um, I was an art director and then a designer at National Geographic, um, and then I spent about four years as a freelance science communicator. So today there are two full-time staff on the graphics team at Scientific American, Amanda Montanez and me. Um, Amanda and I art direct all of the information graphics in the magazine from data visualizations like this example by Nadi Bremer um, and this example by Yo-Yo Cho. To illustrated explanatory diagrams like this example by Violet Francis and everything in between, like this example by Matthew Twombly, that includes some data visualization elements folded into a larger illustrated explanatory diagram. Here's a closer look at one frame within that full magazine spread. Now, sometimes Amanda and I develop the final images ourselves, uh, but most often we hire freelance artists and manage the project. Okay, let's return to this outline. What are science graphics? Let's start with graphics which I generally use as shorthand for information graphics. By my definition, information graphics are illustrations built on a foundation of research that exist primarily to convey information. 
For example, um, here's an information graphic from the pages of Scientific American. The team at Brian Christie Design use visual symbols to convey very specific information that's rooted in research. So in this case, that goal is twofold. One, to show that a variety of different known microbe types reside in a variety of very specific parts of the human body. And two, show how one of the more thoroughly understood microbes interacts with the body. Now for the title pages of that same article, they developed an image that's not a literal representation of the concept, but instead this nods to the idea of a human as being defined by the microbes within. So this is an editorial illustration. Um, it's a metaphorical image that represents the theme of the text with the primary purpose of engaging readers and priming them for the content that follows. So I tend to think of information graphics as a continuum with figurative representations on one end and abstract representations on the other. In the world of science, you could argue that that full continuum can also be referred to as data visualizations. Um, after all, essentially all of our work is rooted in data collection at some stage in the process, from bone length measurements in dinosaur reconstructions to meticulously documented laboratory experiments that build up a more complete understanding of things like photosynthesis, to representations of mathematical expressions like Feynman diagrams, to straight up plotting the raw data itself um, in chart form. But it's probably more useful in most cases to think of the continuum like this, with representative illustrations at one end, data visualizations on the other, and illustrated explanatory diagrams in the middle. Now today I'll mostly be focusing on this portion of the continuum, illustrated explanatory diagrams and data visualizations. Okay, so how do science graphics fit into the practice of science communication? Well, science communication, as many of you know, encompasses a wide range of traditions and frameworks that vary across discipline, time, and space. At its broadest level, um, it generally refers to the idea of sharing information or building knowledge with others that is rooted in the practice or findings of science. At a more granular level, it becomes complicated by who is or should be participants in specific exchanges, the roles of those participants, and the goals of the exchanges. Now, it's tempting to proclaim that visual languages are more universal than spoken and written languages, and that the very act of presenting information in the form of a drawing instead of words makes it more accessible. But that's not necessarily the case. Visual jargon, for example, is just as prevalent as written jargon. Symbols that carry um, highly specific information within a specific context can be a really efficient way to communicate with others that are fluent in that visual language, like your peer group of scientists. Um, but they simultaneously act as a brick wall to outsiders, people that don't know that language. So that said, there's generally a low initial barrier to entry when faced with an image color, form, and composition can trigger a reaction from a viewer without significant conscious effort. So that ability to communicate quickly before asking too much of the audience, um, well, that's a powerful thing when you're vying for eyeballs, um, especially if you prescribe to this idea that people's attention is a limited resource. So in science communication, a wide range of image types serve the purpose of engagement. There's photographs, editorial illustrations, fine art and graphics. Those all have the potential to quickly capture the attention of people in different ways. But to my mind, science graphics are uniquely positioned as visual aids that have the power to both beckon people in and to provide concrete information to influence the conversations that follow. At its best, engagement is followed by learning, which then leads to continued engagement, all within the same frame. For example, um, you're likely familiar with the warming stripes graphics by Ed Hawkins. They are a nod to our warming planet. So no labels or captions are needed in order to get the sense that this stripe pattern is showing a progression of something from a cool blue to a hot red. This pattern reproduces legibly on everything from social media profiles to t-shirts, magazine covers, mugs, and concert screens. But just as critically, the charts live within a spare, dedicated website. That site has easily shareable and downloadable charts for many different locations around the world. And it includes a clear and friendly invitation to use the charts for any purpose, copyright free. Now, all of those boxes can't be ticked for all science graphics, um, nor should they be. It all depends on the goal of the chart. 
but it's an inspiring example of um, a visual about an important topic that was designed to be shared widely in unconventional ways. And it's a super reminder that sometimes graphics can and should kind of be a conversation starter as opposed to a fully kind of labeled out and annotated object to be read. Okay, let's move on to some tips for designing them. Tip number one is to be strategic. So building a graphic can be time and cost intensive. So be realistic when it comes to budget, deadlines, and scope. So before diving into a project, um, ask this guiding question. Would a graphic be useful in helping to convey the information at hand? But when is a graphic useful? Well, to my mind, a graphic might be useful if an image can tell the story more efficiently, effectively, or completely than words like the iconic Feynman diagrams in which that visual stands in for a more abstract formula. Or if the narrative involves complex and intertwining relationships and an image map can help the reader track connections um, like a process diagram. Or if the reader might benefit from seeing and exploring trends and patterns of the complete data set rather than being served up a few key numbers in the text or when a direct and immediate visual comparison is useful in highlighting change or differences between states, such as competing hypotheses or before and after views. Now, I'm not a fan of deciding to build a graphic because there's room or money to spare, and folks like the idea of kind of filling it with a snazzy visual to engage people. So engagement is an honorable goal, but if that's your only goal, I'd um, encourage you to consider if a representative illustration, like a straight up drawing of the object itself, an editorial illustration, like a metaphorical piece of art that's evocative in nature, or a photograph um, might be a more fitting solution. Okay, tip two is to articulate the goal of your graphic. So write down the goal of your graphic before you start drawing. What's the point of the image? Keep it short and succinct, usually about like one to three sentences. That stated goal is your touchstone. So you keep coming back to it to make sure that your graphic doesn't spiral out of scope. It's also a handy statement to have when communicating with collaborators about the project. It can help ensure that intentions are aligned and it can help keep critiques focused on the intended point of the graphic. So here are a few goal statements that I've used to guide graphics in the past. Separate out the entwined concepts of dark energy, the cosmological constant, and vacuum energy, illustrating each and showing how they're connected. So this is a graphic that emerged from that goal statement by um, Federica Fragapan. And there's a closer look at a few details. Here's another goal statement. Um, this is display the author's atmospheric river intensity scale, helping readers see how the two variables help predict storm impact, the amount and duration of water vapor transport. And here's a graphic that emerged from that goal statement with duration on the x-axis, the amount of water vapor on the y-axis. Um, the storm categories are then marked on the right side, connect, connected um, directly with color-coded blocks. Um, from hazardous level five at the top to beneficial level one at the bottom. So this goal statement was show the top three hypotheses for how undersea freshwater reservoirs may form. It should be easy to compare and contrast the different mechanisms. And here's the imagery that emerged from that goal statement. Um, in order to make the differences and similarities across each scenario easy to spot, artist Julia Ditto kept the cutaway perspectives the same in all three, and then thick light blue arrows show the path of fresh water into the reservoir in each cutaway. And here's one more. Um, so this goal statement was, show how an artificial leaf made of silicon nanowires works. In a process similar to photosynthesis in natural leaves, it transforms photons into storable, transportable fuel. And then here you can see that artist Sherry Sinan honored the goal statement by showing not only how an artificial leaf works, but also how it compares to natural photosynthesis. And each step of the process for artificial photosynthesis is aligned with the corresponding step in natural photosynthesis. Okay, tip three, keep context in mind. 
So content is usually pretty clear. Like that's just the information that you're visualizing as articulated in your goal statement. But context is equally important, but it's often to, um, kind of neglected at the start of a project. So what tools will be used to make the graphic? Where will it appear? Who is the audience? And what is the designer's relationship with that audience? And when does it need to be completed? All of those factors shape decisions related to what pieces of the content are critical to include and how it should be presented. So some of these factors are more regimented than others. Um, for example, the destination of your graphic might dictate the size and the format. Um, like a journal that might provide you with very clear kind of dimensions and file type instructions. Um, other variables uh, like the intended audience and accessibility measures, um, those are more complex and less prescriptive. Um, I recommend consciously describing and maybe even writing down the key variables about the context, including where will your image live? So the answer to this question will inform decisions related to both content and style, as well as the dimensions of your graphic um, and therefore the composition or how elements are arranged on that page. It also informs the level of detail that might be appropriate. Um, for example, um, take this Swiss cheese pandemic defense graphic by Ian McKay. It's totally suitable for viewing on a laptop screen or a computer monitor and in print. But I'm guessing you're having a little bit of a hard time seeing and digesting the details um, in this spoken word presentation. Um, the title, subhead, and labels are all critical for a standalone graphic, but combined, those details make this graphic a little bit too dense with information for you to properly read and absorb while also listening to a speaker or, or while um, reading closed captions. So for a live presentation, many of those illegible details can be removed. The speaker will be providing that broader level of context with their voice or via closed captioning. So the graphic doesn't need to be completely self-explanatory. The best solution kind of depends on the point that the speaker would like to highlight, but perhaps um, even something as stripped down as this would make sense. So true, some slide decks do need to operate on a few levels because um, they're often uh, distributed as a proxy for the live presentation. Um, in those cases, leaving all of the text in place might make sense. Um, but if you're optimizing your content for a live audience, I think reducing density is a good idea. Um, if you like the best of both worlds, you could keep the slide less dense and include a link to the original fully detailed graphic um, in the notes. So if it's important to highlight all of the visible details in the original graphic, you can consider a series of static slides that help guide your reader's attention through the graphic and labels in a very focused and intentional way like this. Now you might be thinking that wasn't a very big change, and you're right, it didn't take very long to execute. But what if your original graphic is a flattened bitmap file, so the objects can't be moved independently, edited, or deleted? So for the case of slides or social media posts, you could consider simply just cropping in or highlighting details of that original graphic. Um, in this case, I recommend reducing the contrast of the portions that are outside of the area of interest. Um, you kind of can focus attention like a spotlight and reduce visual noise. Then as you talk through um, the concept, you can direct people's attention to relevant details. So at a magazine, we're constantly dealing with the question of how people will engage with the content. We create at least three different versions of every graphic. Um, so here's an example from an article about tornadoes. Um, this uh, is how the graphics appeared in print. Um, here's the first two pages with an explanatory diagram by Matthew Twombly, and then a map by Daniel Huffman on subsequent pages. So here's how um, those graphics played out online. So one is optimized for viewing on a computer screen that's shown on the left here. And then the other is optimized for mobile phone screens. Now, often all of that same information can be reformatted to be legible in all versions. Um, like this tornado graphic is kind of a, done in a way that's very easy to pull apart and, um, and rearrange the different uh, panels. But sometimes, um, especially in the case of maps, we have to reduce the density of information. Um, let's see, I'm gonna roll you through the, oops. 
well, okay, well, here's the, here's the map on the mobile view. The, uh, the tornado piece was just kind of uh, pulled apart and uh, presented more linearly. But, um, but here, if you look closely at the map, um, we opted to remove tornado touchdown data points in the mobile version. So in the larger versions, we could um, add that kind of extra level of richness and, and more context. But in the mobile version, that just wouldn't be, um, be legible. So we removed that. But the take home message and the, um, the, uh, the results kind of or the conclusions of the researchers were still intact by these larger color panels. Okay, so other questions you should ask yourself. Who is the target audience and what is your relationship with that audience? So this chart was provided as reference material for an article on the rings of Saturn. So the top chart shows how a distant star dimmed in a spotty manner over time as Saturn passed by. So other graphics in the article would get into the research that followed, but first we wanted to present this weird data that captured the scientists' attention. So we presented that data pretty much as is, but as a welcoming gesture to a non-specialist reader, we flagged the take home message clearly with a title to signal that this data presented scientists with an odd pattern, a mystery to solve. Then we shook the jargon out of the labels and added two annotations tied directly to the chart patterns to help explain clearly what people are looking at without requiring them to bounce back and forth between a much kind of larger and dense caption and the image. So here's a side-by-side -side look. Now I'm not trying to suggest that that bottom version should replace the top one in all cases. Um, you'll note that we removed some pretty critical information such as actual flux values, um, which are boxed in orange and blue here, and specificity with regards to time. But because that top chart exists in the primary literature, I have the freedom of stripping out a little bit of that content, knowing that a source citation will lead a reader that needs to know more to the more complete story. And for an article on toxic slime in the Permian, the scientist authors provided us with some great references. Um, the key information was all represented in this paper. But these are pretty specialized representations. So other scientists in the field are likely used to interpreting these kinds of figures, um, but they can be fairly intimidating to non-specialists. So ultimately I keyed, I kind of pulled key elements um, from different figures from that primary source and then gave everything some breathing space. So critically, um, annotations help walk a reader through the concepts one step at a time, providing readers with context at the point in the graphic that is most useful to them. So my text colleague and I also unpacked the jargon. So basically we translated much of the specialized written and visual language into a very, very kind of plain language so that more people could understand it. It's not as precise as using jargon, um, but it's more suitable for an audience that doesn't know that language anyway. Okay, so given the outlet and the audience, what tone or vibe feels appropriate? So the answer to this question, along with the subject matter, will inform decisions related to rendering style and illustrative details. So that's demonstrated here by a pair of graphics that both show an exoplanet um, passing in front of a star. So a coloring book for kids um, may exclude some technical details and jargon, um, and it can be rendered in a more playful style with more playful details um, than a graphic on the same topic for adults, um, and depending on the scenario in which is presented. Um, and I love this wonderfully kind of quirky graphic by Mona Chalabi for The Guardian. Um, it's really well suited to engage general readers with a topic, um, but it probably wouldn't be a great match for an academic journal. Now, tip four is to remember that building a graphic is a process. You can't expect graphics to emerge fully formed right before the deadline in a single go. So with some forethought and structure, you can set up your graphics building kind of process to dovetail with stages in your larger project so that the graphics can be properly reviewed by other people in context. So I recommend starting with lots of fast, low risk doodles. So experiment with different ways to organize the information there's something kind of really freeing about just taking a pencil to paper and just scribbling out ideas. So pencil sketches, they're fast, they foster an exploratory mentality, um, and they're low risk. So after you've narrowed in on a solution that you're happy with, 
you can shift from exploration mode into presentation mode and then make things more intelligible for your collaborators. So at this point, I find it helpful to break the process up into three formal segments, concept sketch, type sketch, and final graphic. So consider dovetailing those steps with other deadlines for your project, um, such as text revision and editing deadlines. So for your concept sketch, create a frame that matches the absolute dimensions of your final product. Use your doodles as a guide and transcribe that information into the larger frame. Include preliminary captions or placeholder text and labels so that you remember to actively design them into the space and that you're considering how they'll relate to the imagery from the start. And then send that concept sketch out for review by your collaborators with specific questions related to what type of feedback you're hoping for at each stage. For example, at this concept sketch stage, I'm most interested in making sure that I'm getting the big picture right and that folks understand the intended flow of information. There's no need to focus on aesthetics at this stage. So feedback should focus on whether the information um, and the path through that information is useful, clear, and accurate. And then if the feedback from collaborators um, on the concept sketch is relatively minor, um, it's, then you can develop a tight sketch. Um, the, at this stage, I'm kind of correcting errors and sharpening the details and um, writing captions or, or collaborating with other folks to write the captions as well. And then for the final graphic, correct any remaining errors and finalize the rendering style, including color. Um, at this, I'm, I'm always paying attention to how labels and other text elements are interacting with that imagery. So by working through those stages with concept sketches that sort of start as broad stroke composition guides, kind of like a text outline, um, that, and, and if that outline is, is deeply rooted in the concept being explained, I'm forced that I'm kind of really, um, I, I'm, I find that I'm forced to really think through the content before getting distracted by drawing the details. Now, you may have noticed that the design tips section of this talk so far haven't included discussion of design fundamentals, mostly since I think those sorts of concepts are best absorbed um, when you're actively working on a project. So instead, I kind of stepped back and presented um, concepts that are particularly helpful when it comes to creating visuals in the service of science communication, um, in part because I also think those concepts are useful to everyone, um, regardless of your previous design training. But I can't really give a talk about science graphics without at least demonstrating how you can use composition, so how things are organized, color, and typography in your favor. Again, for more on design fundamentals and a deeper dive on what I'll be sharing today, um, check out my book, Building Science Graphics. Okay, demo one is a composition makeover. So this is the first installment of a demonstration that takes part in three stages. Um, it's a hypothetical graphic destined for a hypothetical academic journal. So this content is completely made up. Um, the initial graphic includes less than ideal design choices that are not made up. I've seen graphics like these from scientists a lot. Um, so this first makeover stage is limited to changes in composition or how objects are organized within the frame. Then I'll move on to color and typography. So the rendering style will remain constant and consistent throughout all of the stages. Um, it's a fairly standard style that doesn't lean back on kind of advanced illustration training or complicated tools. So the goal of this graphic is to show the pathogenesis of classical cat treat disease and paradoxical cat treat disease, and how the condition can be confirmed by testing for levels of three specific proteins. So here's a closer look at the imagery. And here's the redesigned version of that graphic. So the composition changes I've made are primarily in the service of one, clearly showing the linear flow of the process, and two, facilitating an easy and direct comparison between scenario A on the top and scenario B on the bottom. Here's a look at the before and after side by side. Now, simply due to alignments, the differences between the two scenarios are easier to spot in the version on the right. In the left version, my eye has to scan all corners of the graphic, looking for similarities and differences. 
and the version on the right, I've aligned the information so that a reader doesn't have to search too far for it. Here's a clean view of the before and after compositions again. Now that composition on the left might be something that I'm kind of working through as a sketch in my sketchbook with pencil as I'm trying to figure out the information for myself. But then um, at a certain point when you start to realize that the, the it's not really um, adhering to the goal very clearly, then, um, then you start to move things around so that those alignments uh, kind of can help uh, a reader see spot the differences more easily. Demo two is a color makeover. So this time, our before state is the revised composition. Um, in this before graphic, every object is given a discrete and different color. Now let's see how we can use color in a way that better honors the goal statement. As a reminder, um, that goal statement is show the pathogenesis of classical cat treat disease and paradoxical cat treat disease and how the condition can be confirmed by testing for levels of three specific proteins. Now, color changes here are primarily in the service of one, establishing a hierarchy of information by drawing the reader's attention to key players, and two, facilitating an easy and direct comparison between each scenario. Objects that are the same in both scenarios are now neutral in color. Colorized objects bring attention to the important variables. Here's a closer look at the updated version and then a toggle back to the original and update again. Okay, back to our demo example. Here's a typography um, makeover. So many academic publications request minimal on art text and ask that most of the words be provided on a, in a separate main caption. Now that's likely due to workflow and production related reasons. Um, and it's not really optimal, uh, but working with constraints is one of the fun things about designing. Um, so I've largely honored that here, although I have adjusted um, the caption styles a little bit in this demo, which might not be an option for an author submitting a figure, but would be an option for you um, if you're designing a poster. So normally I'd recommend a smaller introductory caption supplemented with on art annotations. Um, the typography changes here are primarily in the service of one, legibility and readability, and two, establishing a hierarchy and clear two-part grouping. So I've added a figure title, and I've broken the large caption into two smaller captions. Each of those captions addresses the image panel that it is paired with. Here's the starting and ending point. Again, so the drawing style remains the same. The changes are limited to reorganizing the shapes within the frame, using color to help shift focus to key variables, and using typography to help a reader walk through the various elements, starting with a title and then two shorter captions. Now I had a bonus color example, but I'm gonna kind of blast through that um, just so we can get to questions. Um, and yeah, so that concludes my formal remarks and we're back. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, it was actually really great to see, especially how to decrease the noise. Like, I feel like it's something we are all aware of, like when we get kind of noisy about figures, but it was really great to see it very clearly, like color composition and like the way that we add text to it. And I think this is super applicable also to scientific articles where we often get quite flooded. Uh, I think if I may, I would love to open the Q&A ground. Uh, we do have a question in the chat, but I do want to open it because it really relates to what you just talked about. Uh, I am personally a fan of big master figures, so I put all my output into one big figure that you then can print out and use. But I wonder what's your take on that? I wonder, like, let's talk, like, let's stay on a scientific paper, for example. Um, how can we balance this like noise thing versus having then too many different figures that maybe all might tell the story together? Like, how do you strike balance when it's in a more scientific context? Like, yeah, what what's the best practice? Because I do see that maybe there's a value in having like that one key figure that takes it away, but then if it's too full, like, do you have kind of um yeah um, advice, so to say, artistic advice to scientists on this? Yeah, it's really tempting because you've worked so hard on a, a research project to put everything in there. Um, but as you note, sometimes that gets too dense with information. So it really comes down to um, what size do you have to work with and what is the, you know, where what is the setting for a poster? 
uh, at a you know a conference if you're walking people through a poster. I think doing a larger graphic because um, you have more space and just really being thoughtful about how you're walking somebody through that graphic could be great. But you try to reduce that down for um, the actual paper itself, and uh, it just becomes too dense um, and and not very welcoming. Um, but then there's the flip side of that is these graphical abstracts that are becoming a bit more popular, um, where you you are supposed to sort of tell the full story or at least kind of the 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 big big picture hits of your paper in a very small space graphically. But that just requires an editing mindset. Like um, if just think about it in terms of if you're writing your text for a full paper, you're going to leave in a certain amount of detail. If you're trying to communicate your research in a social media post, you're going to edit that down and just hit the main point. I think you just need that same mindset um, uh, with, when you're working with imagery. It's like you just need to edit yourself based on the amount of space that you have available. Yeah, that makes sense. And I do see graphic abstracts are a really great place for us to actually become more creative, and more clear about the message. So it's really great that you bring that up. Um, I would love to bring up a question of Leticia um, Santos de Lima, who asked, could you suggest some free software that can help us on the process of designing and coloring graphics? Uh, free software, that's always a trick, isn't, isn't it? I think um, Inkscape, I think is free. Um, I use the uh, um, Adobe Creative Suite because uh, that's kind of industry standard in publishing, but that's not free. Um, but if you do work at an institution or a, a, a university, um, you can usually get discounts, um, academic discounts. Um, I think in Inkscape, um, I know a lot of people use Canva. Um, I know that there are uh, other uh, tools such as um, BioRender, but that's also not free, so I'm not answering your question usefully there. I know, does, does anybody else have ideas? Please write them in the chat if you use something that you like that's free. Um, I also, also know the Noun project, which is sometimes being used to get icons for certain things, and then you, I'm an old school PowerPoint person, like I really do like editing things in PowerPoint because it's free, and then the yeah, Noun project supplies a lot, yeah. Yeah, PowerPoint um, has its limitations, but it's like any other tool. You just work within the limitations, and it's you know if you're familiar with it and, it, and you're, um, it's easy for you to work with, then it's a good tool. Um, so uh, the noun project Philopic, did you mention Philopic has um, species ones? So that's like if you're working uh, like they think think they have a great um, set of dinosaur illustrations, for example. Um, Philopic um, tends to be a a little bit more uh, probably correct overall. The noun project, you'll get symbols that haven't necessarily been um, created by um, by other scientists. But Philopic, I think it's a, there's a little bit more kind of uh, adherence to being an accurate uh, illustration, if that's important. Sometimes an icon doesn't need to be incredibly accurate, but um, but sometimes it does. So yeah, thank you. Oh yeah, um, somebody wrote Inkscape is free. Great. Yeah. Yeah, just building on. Um... I suppose the idea of resources. Um, but I was wondering, uh, there's a question here that asks, uh, do you have any tips regarding avoiding colors that can be complex for colorblind um, individuals? But I was wondering if there was also resources and you associated with that, perhaps could share those as well. Yeah, so my favorite tip for um, helping with uh, color, you know, making sure that your, your work is accessible to as many people as possible, is um, print it out your graphic on a black and white printer or grayscale, or change your color settings on your computer to grayscale. If you still can't get the main points, then you might be relying on color too much. Um, so that's kind of an easy easy way to sort of help. And, and, and in that case, if I'm, if some of the key information that I'm trying to show with color disappears, I double encode. So then I might like um, make the outline of that object darker or make sure the two um, symbols I use are different forms. So I'm not just relying on color. I'm also relying on another visual cue. There are some great um, resources and more and more appearing online. A lot of programs, like um, I know Illustrator and Photoshop do this. Um, I'm not sure about some others. Uh, you can change to um, to a, a preview setting that allows you to see it under the kind of the two most commonly forms of color blindness. So you can change to that filter to see 
if your main points have been lost or if they still um, are visible. Um, and then there's also a uh, color palette picking tools. I think um, Brewer, Color Brewer might be one of them. If you go to buildingsciencegraphics.com, there's a more to explore tab there, that URL I shared earlier. And there um, I include links to some more um, kind of tools and articles that point out um, other free tools to help you with a uh, with color palettes. I will comment them into the reply to Letizia's question. And that also, um, maybe you also know Fabio Crameri actually set up a color map uh, that's to be used for scientific uh, figures and also goes into different types of color blindness. But I'm putting oh, them nice. into the comments to that one. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. So I actually just post Fabio's link in the nice. chat because that came to my head, my head immediately. Um, someone else also mentioned UQ's Ridis palette as well. Um, moving on to a, another question, there's a question about how do you plot perhaps geological time scales with respective durations? So I guess you've got quite a broad area with a lot of condensed information to represent. How would you approach that complexity? Yeah, I often, um, especially for non-specialists, show uh, the bigger picture in a little bit of a, you know, in a, a tap up above and then kind of zoom in on the area. That allows you to then also zoom in on multiple areas without losing that sense of scale between them. So I might just do, you know, here's here's the big picture for folks that are new to the topic or, you know, maybe haven't grappled with these kinds of timeframes before. And now I'm gonna show you what happened, you know, at the Permian versus what happened now. Um, so you can, you can still get that full image above of the distance, the distance, the time between the two without um, uh, having it dominate the full page. It's really tricky though. It happens with um, like you trying to use logarithmic scales and other topics as well. I really try to avoid use them whenever possible, um, but sometimes the pattern's just not visible without it. So in that case, if I'm using something like a logarithmic scale, I will make sure that I include the tick marks and label those axes very clearly. Um, I'm still not always very um, comfortable with that as the solution. Um, and there was a recent article, a web, uh, I need to pull up that link. Um, uh, there was a recent conversation about alternatives to logarithmic scales. Um, uh, I'll have to look that up again. Thank you. Um, I just actually have a question following on from I think about the idea of showing that kind of change or journey throughout time. I was also thinking about storytelling and graphics and mm. how do you want to represent that? Because in one sense, you want to kind of just represent perhaps researchers data as it is, you know, in a way that's consumable, but also a lot of data um, needs explanation as well, which often kind of describe its impact. Um, do you weave that into your graphic design or is it something you can pick and choose with? Yeah, no, we do that a lot, uh, like kind of the storytelling and narrative um, approach in magazine work. And I think more and more uh, it's being used elsewhere by scientists too. Um, you notice I, I shared several examples by Matthew Twombly, who's a fabulous artist to work with, who um, approaches things in a very kind of, um, uh, in, in a way that it tells a story, but there's still really kind of hardcore science and sometimes data visualizations embedded within that. Um, so uh, you can take that approach and strip out maybe some of the more kind of figurative pieces for your, uh, you know, your peers in, in a science content, in a, like an academic context, but then um, having a narrator, like a person in that scene kind of then helps non-specialists understand that information. But what I like most about that kind of narrative approach is it it allows you to sort of um, figure out what these key points are and how you want to walk somebody through that. And then you're doing it in a very intentional way. Um, and you're not just saying, here's the information. Um, I'll tell you what the key, the highlight is, but I'm going to kind of let you connect the dots on your own. Um, this like you, you connecting the dots one at a time for the reader. And I think especially now that we're all trying to absorb so much information, it, it just it's kind of honors the reader's time too. It's like, okay, you know, here's the information for you, but I'm going to walk you through it really quick. Like, you know, so you understand why I got to that final point, as opposed to saying, you know, go figure it out and then read my final point. Um, so I think it's a really, and, and it's, it suits itself so well to being pulled apart and then rearranged for other contexts. Um, you can put it on a mobile phone. It's still kind of a linear way of reading and thinking. I actually also wrote on Matthew's name because I really love this mix of figurative and um, yeah, more infographic 
uh, designs because it it also gives you as a viewer who doesn't know anything about tornadoes in that case for example with that figure like something you can connect to you can connect to that tornado being there and then you maybe see wind speeds there on the diagram you're like okay i can understand that like i think this makes us really important and i think it also brings me a little bit to a question that i had because i think a lot of the viewers might be on the very scientific side of things so to say where often you have standard graphs that have to be used or standard um ways to to show your data right and I mean, sometimes it's helpful that these kind of um, data plots are then recognizable by your peers and stuff like this. But I wonder, like, how do we sometimes get that naya conversion to maybe a new type of graphic? Because I, I do see like when I see in my field, someone uses a new type of graphic, I'm immediately set back because I feel like this is not how I know my data. But sometimes it's needed to tell a better story. And I sometimes wonder, like, is there maybe a way to show both figures and then slowly have like a transition between both? And this is, I think, just a point where we often struggle to improve our graphics because there is a way how they're expected to look like, right? Especially yeah. in, when it comes to articles and like publication and stuff like this. And there's the very real variable of like wanting to be able to look at your new data compared to somebody who worked on it 10 years ago and to be able to have a very easy like, okay, our plots are using the same approach so I can compare across time. Um, it is tricky. I know um, often when I work with scientist authors and we're trying to convert something for another audience, um, they'll resist uh, changing up the graphic, the the chart type. Sometimes um, what I'll do then, uh, you know, and, and I, I weigh that um, and sometimes like, OK, I understand why why it's good to keep it this. In that case, um, that's where annotations are really lovely because you can point out and at, at, you know, very specific parts and say this that's why this is important and um and then maybe you know that's the the first image you come to and then say here's another way of looking at it you know or or for a better look at this element here's another chart so i think if your alternate approach helps people see that data or information from another perspective that would be useful in the context of what you're writing, completely valid to show the data in a few different ways. And, and just be like, here's, you know, here's our, our traditional, or here's a, a traditional view of this data, but I think it's useful to show it this way too. So you can note this particular pattern that caught my eye. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's something to be said about shared languages and tradition, but if you get stuck in that just because that's how you do it and people are questioning it, then it gets a little bit, um, it, I think it can kind of stunt the growth of of, um, of the field. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely hear you. I think I also got my biggest um, input so far, like inspiration actually when someone was really good in a presentation within a group meeting or so, like in a figure, in an article, usually the same ends up everything looks uh, ends up looking the same but then some people have the skill to just what you showed break things down for a different medium and suddenly in the presentation they digest it so well that you really understand it and I sometimes I'm really hoping that there will be more flexibility in the future in the scientific field that we can actually explain what we do but I really love that for now we got uh, presentations posters and graphic abstracts to become a bit more creative maybe also as scientists so um, I was maybe wanting to go back to one question that we have in the Q&A. Uh, Kevin actually asked if there are maybe one or two studies that um, help you understanding or that, that go into the effectiveness, so to say, of learning with graphics. So I, I can imagine, Kevin, please correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of maybe proving that better figures help the learning, um, maybe in connection to the science that we have. Do you know if there's like... Um, some resources we can read into because I can imagine like I remember when I focused a lot on making figures during my PhD my supervisor would do this and say please don't do that like there's not enough time right so I, I maybe Kevin that's where you're coming from but maybe like some kind of study that helps us see yes graphics matter and they make your science bigger so to say or more seen yeah so perception researchers are working on this but the field is younger than i would like it to be i feel like a lot for a long time people were just making proclamations like well of course this you know and now it's starting to be like okay well where's the evidence i mean um uh, and so uh, there are lots of studies that focus on very specific case studies so um uh, there was a great one oh i'm kind of Chen is her last name of one of the authors. Um, I have, again, they're in that more to explore um, thing on my website, I believe. But um, there's one that uh, says, 
your the impression of your article uh, if you have well designed figures based on kind of some best practices so that's also a little bit fuzzy what is a well designed graphic but 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 figures in a in a um, paper that were designed redesigned by a professional designer um the result was uh that readers thought that 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 those authors were smarter and knew their stuff more so like there's there's some subtle things that are happening that's not saying what they took away from informationally but that is implying that there's a um an impact on percept on on um your your perception of the authors not necessarily just of the work itself so there's some studies that are starting to show that um other studies that um, memorability um it, so if you want somebody to remember your paper, like to not have the standard, you know, just the bar charts, but some of the things that um, that make it memorable, uh, you know, so if you want somebody to remember your paper later, that's kind of another area. And like, yes, having unique chart forms um, and titles and some very intentional uh, use of words can do that. That was a famous study by Michelle Borkin, maybe about 10 years ago now. Um, so there's lots of different pieces. Um, Multiple Views is a blog a site that um, was starting to pull some of those things together. I think it was active for a couple of years. It might be a little quiet now. The Data Stories podcast often has interviews with um, perception researchers. Um, uh, Steve Fal Falconieri is somebody who st is, who does a lot of work in this area, um, but there's not really a like it's, it's not an old enough um, field where there's like a huge consensus, and all of the situations are so um, specific that it's hard to make generalizations yet. But there's definitely um, evidence building that, uh, and some of it's a little bit counterintuitive. Like chart junk was like thought to be very bad for a while, like you know having little illustrative details that. Um, just distract from the data, you know, that's bad. That was kind of the sense a while ago. But researchers are like, yeah, well, that chart junk is getting people to remember your stuff. So what's your goal? Um, but yeah. I mean, I think I also uh, save some papers just for their visuals that they have. I do have uh, kind of a library of figures that then become my my kind of template for creating our figures on it. So I think it does make sense to create memorial graphics. I will post what you just mentioned in comment to Kevin's question. Um, I actually quite like the idea of these small uh, graphic graphics we were mentioning right at the end. In a way, the if for some reason, they always give me a flashback to perhaps medieval marginalia. There's almost doodles in the paragraphs, which just go like, oh yeah, that makes it now cemented in my brain that this is a, a thing that exists. That's the reference. Um, yeah. I wanted to follow on with a point actually um, with perhaps working with emotion in these graphics. Uh, and I was really triggered by the graphic you showed of the baby with measles on. That's quite an emotive image. Um, and similarly, I think people sometimes might ac even accidentally communicate emotion. If they have a uh, a graph or something and something is depicted in red people might see that as a, a bad thing even if it's not meant to be considered a bad um how should you consider like um emotion when you're communicating it and is there a point perhaps which you perhaps should be less emotive or more emotive with communicating for graphics yeah that's a really interesting and complicated question so I think it kind of really comes down to the goal statement and your context and, you know, what are you trying to do with this graphic and uh, where will it live? Who is it for? How, what is your relationship with them? Um, um, I think this idea that, uh, that we need to not have kind of a, a emotion or pretend that we're not humans creating things for other humans um, can lull us into this false sense of, I'm being very objective here it was like I, nobody can be fully objective. So I think it's just really um, a, a being intentional and asking for feedback from colleagues and collaborators, um, pe maybe people from your intended audience. Um, and kind of that's why I also like having that goal statement, because then you can kind of keep coming back to that. And you're like, OK, is this starting to skew? Like if, if my objective here is not a piece of, of advocacy work, Maybe I want to make sure that I'm not trying to to push buttons that aren't relevant in this setting. 
if my goal is to be an advocate for something like, hey, climate change, you know, people look, listen, maybe it's okay to amp up some of those um, signals and, 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 and try to trigger some emotion in other people. Um, but that should be a conscious thing that maybe is discussed among collaborators on a particular project. Um, uh, so I think it's just really about being thoughtful and intentional and talking with, with people, your collaborators and your intended audience. Thank you. Uh, we have perhaps time for one more question. Um, and I think there was a question about accessibility as well. Um, I think might have touched on that already with uh, colorblind individuals or color deficient sight. Um, is there anything else, else you might add when you consider accessibility in your work? Yeah, and the other thing that, um, you know, I, people always think, you know, okay, colorblind uh, friendly palettes. Yeah, that's a great thing. Another thing that people I think are starting to realize everybody needs to think about is alt text for digital imagery. So if you're writing blog posts, um, if you're submitting work to a journal or, or anybody else, include alt text descriptions of your images because somebody's writing them for you somewhere like if they're going online in, in a journal thing somebody probably is writing them for you like if you want to control what that is and you know what you want that main point to be for somebody who might not be able to see it if you write that alt text i bet they'll use it because like that takes you know so um I also find that when you're working on, um, on things like goal statements for graphics that often translates very well into um, alt text, um, but it's just a habit. I'm always writing credits and alt text for every image, and I have that living with the images. So if I use that image somewhere else, I have that information handy. Um, so that's kind of a, a standard um, accessibility thing at this point. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So we have, I think, actually time for one last question. Um, and I think that probably another thing is, um, I suppose, maybe we could finish with like, are there the key points you want people to take away when approaching graphics, especially given quite a scientific audience and we really probably be very precious with all the technical information we want to share. Um, what would a key takeaway do you think for us, as mostly a geoscience audience? Yeah, I think a key takeaway is to be kind of thoughtful and intentional and plan it in like, you know, you're writing, when you're writing text or you're, um, you know, you're creating outlines, like be thinking about imagery then and how can it work with your text and how can you schedule that into your timelines? Like, don't just wait till the last minute and do a graphic. That graphic that you did might be a great doodle or concept sketch stage one, but if you gave it a little bit more time, and a little bit more thought, you'd have you'd be able to edit it down. You'd be able to move a few things around. You'd be able to kind of take it next level, and it wouldn't take that much more time. It's just starting it earlier, so starting it earlier in the process. Um, and the other thing is just always um, be asking questions about where will this graphic live, because um, that's going to impact so many things: density of information, all this other stuff we've been talking about. Excellent. So we are at an end now. I want to thank you, uh, Jen, for presenting today and Maria for hosting. Um, I want to thank everyone or the audience for staying with us today. This um, webinar is recorded and will be uploaded to the EG YouTube channel next week. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>